Hello, I'm Farah Ismail. Welcome to our latest World Cup countdown program. As we build up to Qatar 2022, the Middle East's first World Cup, which kicks off in November. Each month, we're focusing on a different region, and this time it's North and Central America. Canada's fans are excited after their country finished as the region's top qualifier. We'll take a closer look at their team. The United States are also in the mix after missing the last finals in Russia. But will they be able to surpass the success of their Women's World Cup winners? Joining us to talk through it all are former U.S. international and current Bean Sports analyst Christopher Sullivan, who's near Palo Alto in California, and Canadian sports analyst Scott Rintoul, who's in Vancouver. We've got lots to get through with four teams having qualified from the North and Central American region. Canada finished top of the table, followed by their 2026 World Cup co-hosts Mexico and the United States. Costa Rica qualified via the playoffs. Here's how they've been drawn in the group stage for the finals here in Qatar. We'll take a closer look at each one shortly. But let's first focus on the informed team. Canada will be making just their second World Cup appearance. Jody Vance reports from Vancouver. Canadians are passionate about their sports teams. Generally, those playing baseball, basketball, and of course, ice hockey. But more recently, fans are turning to a different game. This is my first time ever seeing a soccer game. The success of the men's and women's sides has caused a massive spike in interest in the sport. The Canadian women's team won Olympic gold in Tokyo, followed by the men's team qualifying for just their second World Cup. Much of this success is down to the influence of coach John Herdman. John Herdman has brought so much confidence to the Canadian national team program that it attracts winners, right? Winners attract winners. He had medal success as an Olympic uh, coach for the Canadian women. He's more than brought that to the Canadian men. This group of players is much more diverse than the team that played at the 1986 World Cup in Mexico. Among them, the Canadian immigrant from Ghana, Alfonso Davies. The Bayern Munich player has captured the attention of the soccer world and is thriving under Herdman. While Croatian-born Milan Borjan tells everyone how proud he is to be part of this team. Happy to bring, to, to give back something to Canada that Canada gave it to me. You know, new life, new everything. Experts think November's World Cup could be a turning point for the sport in Canada. Now this is an opportunity to be there in, in, in Qatar this year and then in Canada, United States and Mexico in four years. This will set a, a real uh, transition for Canada to the next level. The recent success is already paying off with greater enrollments in youth programs and fans ready for a taste of World Cup glory. We're going, we are going to Qatar! With hopes of being a dark horse, Canadians are counting down to the tournament in Qatar with excitement not felt in a generation. Jody Vance, Al Jazeera, Vancouver. And here's what's facing Canada when the World Cup starts in November. They're in Group F with Belgium, who were until recently the top ranked side in the world. Morocco and Croatia are the other teams in that group. Let's bring in our guests now. And Scott, I want to start with you because Canada have never even scored a World Cup goal before. Can this team cause an upset here, do you think? Well, Farah, the short answer is yes, but it will most certainly be an upset if Canada specifically can take a point or perhaps even earn a win against either of the European sides in the group. Manager John Herdman. He is already laying the groundwork of Canada being a massive underdog in this group. He began today in the media saying it would be a monumental task in the group. But if an upset is to occur, it'll happen for a couple of reasons. One is that fearless, cohesive approach that we saw from Canada during this last round of qualifying. Canada were not intimidated by reigning powers like Mexico and the United States, even away from their home pitch. And the other factor would be the ability to generate goals from a variety of sources. 
Canada led the group through the last stage with 23 goals across 14 matches. And those goals came from eight different sources. Yes, it will be an upset if Canada can find a way through this group or perhaps earn a result against one of those European sides, but it most certainly is possible. And Christopher, um, Canada's coach, John Herdman, Scott just mentioned him. He's had quite an unusual career up until now, hasn't he? Absolutely. I think it's been a fascinating path to this point right here. I mean, he's coached for seven years with the women's team and he's won every competition that he's been in or placed medal rounds in, in Olympic uh, qualifying in Pan American. They won the gold. Uh, it's very interesting. You know, I agree with Scott unequivocally, 100 percent. I think they were the best team and merited uh, qualifying top of the group. We for the first time you've seen Mexico. That's been a power along with the U.S. Um, subpar performance throughout the whole qualifying under Gerardo Tata Martino. The U.S. Uh, that, that normally never looked past Canada because I think Canada and the U.S. are very similar similar when you look at the composition of what they bring. Uh, but Cap Canada is even more diverse. When you talk about the diversity of, of the players uh, from where they have all over the world is really impressive. Unfortunately, I think Costa Rica and Canada are in the toughest groups in Qatar. Uh, they, they come up against Belgium, Croatia, and Morocco. I think they can get three points against Morocco, having watched Morocco without Zayic against the U.S. in a recent friendly the tough one is going to be Belgium. And much like 86, when they played against that great French team with the star-studded midfield of Platini, Jerez, Tiganan, Fernandez, you're looking at the best midfielder in Kevin De Bruyne. So if they can get a point, I actually believe that they can get a point between Belgium and Croatia, one of those two. The way that they played and performed, you know, we're talking about a year ago in qualifying. Will they be up to the performance of the day at optimal performance? Canada could take anyone in this competition or surprise anyone the way they played. And Scott, Canada's demographics have changed a lot since they last qualified in 1986. How much of an impact has that had on the current national team? Far, it's had a significant impact and you need look no further than the roster and the squad that was named by John Herdman earlier today for the upcoming friendlies leading up to the World Cup two months from now. More than a third of the team are players born outside of Canada's in fact, if you look at immigration trends in Canada over the last 30 to 40 years, you can see a significant uptick. This is a country that is more than 20% immigrants, and the vast majority of Canadians are very proud of the fact that we're multicultural. And when you look at John Herdman being an immigrant himself, a story that he has mentioned, Alfonso Davies, as was mentioned in Jody's report, being a refugee who came from Ghana to this country, they are the faces of this team, but they lead a very strong contingent of immigrants. So, yes, it has had a significant impact on Canada's soccer fortunes on the men's side. Okay, well, let's shift our focus to the other team from North America, the United States. They're back at the finals after missing the last World Cup in Russia. The furthest they've ever got is the semifinals back at the very first edition in 1930. Since then, it's been the U.S. women's team that has enjoyed the most success with four World Cup title wins. The U.S. will be taking on Iran in their group. The countries haven't had formal diplomatic relations for more than 40 years. Iran won their only previous World Cup meeting 2-1 in 1998. England and Wales are the other two teams in that group. Well, Christopher, are you confident that the U.S. can get out of the group stage? Well, I, I think you definitely don't want to be arrogant and you want to take your opponents, uh, you know, with, with, with certain credibility. And I think Wales will be a very interesting battle. I think both teams are on similar levels when you look at the star power of Gareth Vale and others like Ramsey. And it's a well-coached team and they had to fight to get here. Um, the game against Iran, we lost against Iran in 98. Uh, I think that that team under Carlos Quiroz that's just come back and did it extremely well. They got four points in, in 2018 where they beat, uh, they tied Portugal and they beat Morocco out of the gates and then lost to, I think they lost the second game. I can't remember who that was against, but um, they have players that can score. They have top forwards equally like the United States. We have a young generation that has an American in each group of Champions League. But the game's not played on paper, and that's what makes it so exciting. Uh, we have a team that's finally starting to take shape, play a little bit better, but the pool is deeper than it's ever been. Well, Scott, Canada did beat the USA at the start of the year. 
What did you think of the U.S.'s qualifying campaign? I thought at times the group showed its youth. And Christopher's point is very well made. This is not a lack of talent on this U.S. roster. This is a deep pool and a very talented one. Qualifying round, the final one, that the U.S. struggled when they played outside of the United States to generate results. I'm not sure if that was a lack of experience or perhaps a little overconfidence after what was an extremely successful 2021 campaign in which the U.S. won the CONCACAF Nations Cup and Gold Cup. It's not a lack of talent. It may be a lack of experience, but the U.S. does have the potential to rise up on the biggest stage football has to offer. And to me, this group really comes down to that first match against Wales. I'm not discounting Iran by any means and the political ramifications, as you mentioned, Farah, coming in to this topic will certainly play into that match as well. But it's a lot of pressure on the U.S. and Welsh side coming into that first match together. But yes, I agree with Christopher. This team is certainly talented enough to make its way through the group. Can it come together at the right time? And will that youth serve them well instead of being a lack of experience? Well, thanks, guys. We'll come back to you both shortly. But now let's take a look ahead. The 2026 World Cup will be vastly different from November's here in Qatar. The tournament is spread over three countries, the U.S., Mexico, and Canada, and for the first time ever will feature 48 teams. But supporters in Washington, D.C. are unhappy that the U.S. capital wasn't chosen as one of the host cities. Mike Hanna spoke to fans there. U.S. fans excitedly awaiting the beginning of the Qatar World Cup in a matter of weeks. The interest all the more intense here because the game is part of Washington's culture. Almost every school plays it at all levels, and the local professional team, DC United, has substantial support. Fan groups like the Screaming Eagles could be described as fanatical. There's a lot of fandom, a lot of support, a lot of passion for the game, um, and uh, it's, uh, it's important to us. Given this passion, there's a degree of anger that DC was not selected as a host city as it was in 1994, the last time the US hosted the tournament. And we are the, na the nation's capital. That, I mean, that to me is just, I don't know what the thinking behind that was, but I mean, how many other countries do not host from their nation's capital? There's a place to play in virtually every Washington neighborhood. It's important to note that in the US, the name of the game is soccer. Football is a different sport entirely. But then there's a team called Inter Miami CF. The CF stands for Club de Football, a nod to the many Hispanic supporters. And in Miami, each game is like a festival. The party has been ongoing since the city was selected as one of the 2026 venues. We're excited about the World Cup coming down here, um, just because it's finally happening in our backyard. The kids, the, you know, they're loving the atmosphere and how, uh, you know, everybody's so excited about the World Cup. Millions of U.S. fans like these will be watching when the Qatar World Cup gets underway. But already there's a sense of anticipation about what happens beyond when the World Cup comes to the region in just over four years' time. Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, Washington. Christopher, what do you think of the 48-team format? Do you think it's too many countries? Well, I think most pundits and, and certainly my colleagues, uh, Richard Keyes and Andy Gray, would say it's way too much. And uh, in the United States, they play the NC2A tournament where you get to the Sweet 16. It starts at 64. So for Americans, you know, I think that they, they would understand it. For the rest of the world, it's one of those new rules that is different from the traditions, but we've jumped to 32 from 24, and now they're going to 48. And I think it'll be a shorter tournament for some teams before they go out. Uh, and we just have to deal with it. I mean, that's the only thing that I could say. I, I do believe that with Scott saying, Canada has three places. I think it's Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. And then you have in Mexico, they have um, uh, Mexico City, Monterrey, and then Guadalajara, I believe. And then you have all the cities in the United States. So really, three countries and big countries as well will be able to accommodate so many teams and so many cultures uh, watching this fantastic event in 2026. It's going to be amazing. Well, Scott, what sort of legacy do you hope the 2026 World Cup will leave for the game in Canada? 
hopefully something that resembles the improved results and increased expectations that we saw from our Olympic programs following the 20, 2010, pardon me, Winter Games in Vancouver. Leading up to those games, there was an influx of money and resources made possible by a lot of different sponsors across Canada and a lot of different organizations and our athletes benefited tremendously. That has increased the expectation across this country when it comes to the Olympics. And I think we could see something similar on the soccer side. Our women's te team has certainly led from the front, much like our neighbors to the South in the United States, Canada on the women's side, current Olympic champions that started back as Christopher referenced earlier when John Herdman took over the women's side and they surprised everyone in London in 2012 by winning an Olympic bronze and taking the Americans to their limit at that point in time, the number one country in the world. So our women have laid out a template that hopefully our men can emulate and hopefully 2026 is a springboard into future results that resemble those. Let's take a look at Mexico now. They finished second in their qualifying table behind Canada. And they've got quite a match coming up in the group stage against Lionel Messi's Argentina. They'll also be facing Saudi Arabia and Poland. Mexico is woven into the history of the World Cup. The Stadium Azteca in Mexico City was the first venue to host two World Cup finals. And it was also where Diego Maradona scored the famous Hand of God goal and goal of the century in the same game against England in 1986. Our correspondent John Holman has more from Mexico City. This is the Cathedral of Mexican football, although that's perhaps the wrong way to describe what is quite a raucous and rowdy ground, the Azteca Stadium. And it's got a long history with the World Cup. Two finals were played here in 1970 and in 1986. And in general, this is a tournament that Mexicans get excited about. About 80,000 people are expected to travel from here to Qatar to cheer on their team, El Tricolor. That's the nickname for the national side based on the three colors in the Mexican flag. That doesn't necessarily mean that people are expecting that much from them. Mexico's never been past the quarterfinals of any World Cup, and this is generally regarded as not a particularly vintage crop of players. Uh, the country in general actually is on its biggest trophy drought in 15 years, and that's the men's, women's, uh, and the youth teams. But despite that, whenever they go to a World Cup, Mexicans know how to celebrate to the point where the Mexican foreign minister has actually explicitly warned them not to take any tequila in their suitcases uh, to Qatar. It's not going to be a problem uh, in four years' time when the World Cup is actually held on home ground here together with the United States and Canada. Christopher, not a great run for Mexico. They've gone out in the round of 16 in the last seven World Cups. Can this year be their year? Well, I mean, they call it El Quinto Partido, the fifth match in Mexico, and it's been stuck in their head. Uh, qualifying, as, as Scott mentioned earlier, was not a, a very good performance under Gerardo Tata Martino. In fact, the fans have been chanting, Fuera Tata, Fuera Tata. And, um, they, you know, they've had the recent injury of uh, Jesus El Tecatito Corona. What a nickname that is, Tecate Corona, two beers. So, you know, is he a party boy? We don't know, but he's, he's from Porto. He won't be there. El Chucky Lozano at Napoli is one of their star players. Raul Jimenez hasn't caught his best form since the head injury that he had with Wolves. So they're having problems with some of their star players. They, they've underperformed. There's been a drought of goals for Mexico. And I think Mexico, you know, that first game against Poland is going to tell the story of the group because they have Poland, Argentina, Saudi Arabia. They'll be playing against Poland for that second place. This, in my opinion, and I think with the fans, the sentiment, and they are some of the greatest fans in the world, is really dire. You know, I mean, they, they really feel that Mexico is not going to do well. Scott, only once have Mexico beaten Canada or the U.S. in the last three years. Do they have a chance? Well, they have a chance to get out of their group because that's what Mexico traditionally does, seven consecutive World Cups to the round of 16. Getting past that hurdle, as Christopher mentioned, has been somewhat of a challenge, a daunting one. What's interesting about Mexico is that despite their poor qualification round in the final stage, they still finished with the same record as Canada, but that tells you the different standards between the two countries. What surprised everyone, including me, was Mac Mexico's lack of finish in the last round. Mexico is the CONCACAF squad 
that you depend on for goals and you have known traditionally as one that does not lack offense. But that was not the case over the past year. Mexico scoring just 17 goals in the 14 matches of qualifying. They do have Christopher entirely. That game against Poland is the one that stands out. And if Mexico gets off to a good start in that game and wins that game and takes three points, you feel very good about their chances of getting to the round of 16. But to harken back to what's happened in the past year and this particular group of players, I'm not particularly optimistic about their chances of going beyond the round of 16. And now to the final team from the North and Central American region, and that's Costa Rica. They were the last team to qualify for the tournament through the intercontinental playoffs, beating New Zealand here in Qatar back in June. They find themselves in a very tough World Cup group against four-time winners Germany, 2010 champions Spain and Japan. Alessandro Rampietti spoke to fans who are hoping to win their way to Qatar. Costa Rica's classic match between Saprissa and Alajuelense always brings out the strongest of emotions among football craze fans known as ticos. Shaky economic conditions in the country have meant a reduction in the sale of World Cup packages. For many fans, their only chance of getting to Qatar is by participating in raffles like this. Winning it would be a dream come true. Football fascinates me, and in such a spectacular location, but prices are steep, so we can only hope. Travel agencies say only around 500 of Costa Rica's 5 million inhabitants will make the trip to Doha. Those who will be watching from home say they will still be cheering on their team. Qatar will be the Ticos' sixth participation in a World Cup overall. The third consecutive time in a row that they qualified. Not bad for such a small country. Despite a rocky qualification campaign, fans hope the team will repeat its historic performance from 2014 in Brazil, where they reached the quarterfinals. The side earned the label of giant killers after finishing top of the group they shared with Italy, England and Uruguay. Former defender and national legend Michael Umania scored the winning penalty that sent Costa Rica into the quarterfinals in Brazil. He says the current team has what it takes to get out of the group stage once again. The truth is we like being in a group like this one, to compete with the best. That's what you do in a World Cup, face the best. I feel optimistic. I know our national team shows its best when it faces the world's most powerful. The next generation of players hoping for another strong showing in Qatar. Alessandro Pietti, Al Jazeera, San Jose, Costa Rica. Christopher, can memories of what that team achieved in 2014 help them here? Well, I mean, that's the big question. I think that they track Costa Rica very similar to that golden generation from Chile that won't be in, in Qatar um, under Jorge Luis Pinto. In 2014 in Brazil, I was there. I mean, they topped the group with Uruguay, England, and Italy. And then they got to the quarterfinals and lost 4-3 in penalties against the Netherlands. Now they have a different, you know, they, they have a history of having Colombian coaches. The coach they have now, Luis Fernando Suarez, he's a little more defensive, but he has, his, he has history and experience in a World Cup. So, I mean, this is a team of old players. Can he squeeze that final bit of juice? From the, lemon, uh, from the lemon of these players, Kaylor Navas, who's a legend in Costa Rica, and then you have Celso Borges, players with 150 caps. Um, and that was Brian Ruiz as well, Joel Campbell, who scored the goal against New Zealand to get them there. If they sprinkle enough fresh young players from Costa Rica, it could be Puro Vida and they can go through, but the odds are against them. Scott, what do you think? Are Costa Rica facing an impossible task? Far, it certainly feels like it in a group with Spain, Germany, and Japan, and while they have all of that veteran experience that Christopher talked about, they do struggle to score goals. And you can expect Los Ticos to try to frustrate their opponents, to play a physical brand of football, to play a very defensive brand of football as well, and hope to generate the odd chance here or there, be opportunistic, perhaps go to penalties as well. It's Spain off the hop, and then it's Japan finishing with Germany as well. If the upset is to occur, you would think it would have to be early in their group stage of matches, but it does not look very promising. They've drawn an extremely tough group, 
And we'll see if their experience pays off, but I'm not very optimistic about that happening this time around. Let's just catch up on what's been happening here in the host country, Qatar. The venue for the World Cup final, Lucille Stadium, has undergone a major stress test ahead of the tournament. It staged the Super Cup between the champions of Egypt and Saudi Arabia with a near capacity crowd of 75,000 supporters. That's all we have time for. So big thank you to our guests, Christopher Sullivan and Scott Rintoul. Next month, we'll be switching continents to focus on the Asian teams that'll be heading to Qatar as we get ever closer to November's main event. And of course, Al Jazeera will keep you right up to date every step of the way.